a lot of people doubt what they're capable of. They don't think they're capable. Mm -hmm. They think they, Oh, I don't have good um, willpower or I'm a hedonist. I just want to feel good. So I'm never going to give up whatever the thing is. But the thing is I'm a bigger hedonist. Hey, Tracy, nice to see you. Hey, Liv. Thanks um, for hi, me. Tracy. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we're we so happy about? to have you because we have at least I was checking out checking out your website and there are so many topics <laughs> and oh, questions. Yeah. For, I have so many questions for you, especially around gut health, because that's yeah, something fine. that we've been discussing lately on the show. So I guess we can start with your background. Um, uh, I read that you have a PhD. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so I did a I did a program. It was a joint program. I was mainly enrolled in UC Berkeley, and that's in Berkeley, California. And then that was a joint program with UC SF Medical School, which is the University of California, San Francisco. And um, one of the things I really was fascinated with learning is how the industrialization of our culture has affected our health and happiness. And um, I did a lot of research on indigenous groups, people who live in a more traditional way, I guess you might say that's kind of a simplification, but people who live more of an ancestral lifestyle. And there's clear data showing that as people become industrialized, as they start eating more processed foods, being under more stress, you know, getting less sleep, sitting more, you know, being indoors more, it goes on being exposed to more toxic chemicals, then we start to notice really drastic rises in chronic disease and mental health issues. And so that's something I've been, I was wondering about professionally, but then my mom got Crohn's disease. Plus I, in grad school, I had, I started having, well, it started when I was 19, I had my first panic attack. My dad was a psychiatrist. So that was kind of ironic, but his tools didn't really work for me. So then my mom got sick And so I had been kind of trying to deal with anxiety for a long time and going the conventional route wasn't working for me. And then um, in grad school, it got worse because grad school is really stressful. So I was like, you know, like I was really struggling there and I had gut issues too, which wasn't a coincidence. And then my mom got Crohn's disease. And so I basically, long story short, I ended up using a lot of my background, theoretical background to, and read, finding some books by people who had healed themselves of Crohn's to help my mom get herself into remission. And so she's been quiescent, which is the technical word for, it's kind of like remission for an autoimmune mm-hmm. disease. It hasn't, the Crohn's hasn't been active since 2004. She's never had a relapse and she's not on wow. any you know, suppressive medications. And so that almost never happens. And she got to keep her colon. They told her she would have to lose her colon and she got to keep her colon. So, um, that was a huge eye opener for me that we have so much wow. more control over our health than we we were taught. And also I learned how, even though my dad was a doctor and I loved and respected him so much, I realized his toolbox was limited and there was mm-hmm. so much more for, to, that could help people that doctors aren't being taught, medical schools aren't teaching, um, but they are available. The science is there. Yeah. Cause I find that so interesting, like what you're talking about at the moment, because I don't know what the, what it's like over where you guys both are, but here in New Zealand, like natural medicine, there is still like, would you call yourself like doing natural medicine? Is that what gut health is all about? Yeah. You know, I noticed that titles are kind of like fashion. There's like skinny mm. jeans and then yep. there's like you know, we bootleg and like, whatever, we just keep changing. So it was natural medicine, holistic medicine, then it became mm. integrative medicine because it's integrating science. So it's not just, you know, a bunch of hoo-ha or whatever yeah. and um, traditional medicine, but that some people think that isn't scientific, even though there can be a lot of science behind it. And so, mm. and then there's this movement called functional medicine, which is a movement of doctors and scientists that are very, they use science-based tools that of uh, lifestyle supplements, herbs to try to address the root causes of illness instead of just managing symptoms, which is what a lot of our conventional medical model does. And so, um, but, but it's not, those doctors can also still do medications and surgery, but they're more of a last resort, not a first resort. So Mm -hmm. I do say I practice functional lifestyle medicine. It's a combination. It's a functional medicine approach to using lifestyle changes to help people heal the root causes of their illness, which can Mm -hmm. it's physical and mental illness are the same. They're not separate. Your mind in your body there's it's just a conceptual 
distinction. They're the same. If something's going on in your body, you're going to feel it mentally and emotionally, whatever thoughts and emotions you have are going to create chemical reactions that, you know, that are going to change how your cells are functioning in your body. Totally. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, like you're saying that, uh, the, the terms for this is all changing. And I find, I love this, not, I don't know if we call it a shift, but like the fact that a holistic or traditional type of medicine is being taken more seriously. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the things that attracted me to me finding you on, on, uh, on LinkedIn that a couple of months ago was because it was, it was like that it was what you were talking about that I found really fascinating in your background. What about gut health affects our mental health? That's a really wonderful, beautiful, huge question. And I'll try to be succinct, but it's a huge topic. Totally. So basically, <laughs> One of the things that's fascinating is that your brain and your gut evolved from the same cell when you were an embryo. And so there's a direct connection that has never ended between your gut and your brain. So this happens with um, nerves, nerves connecting, like you have your vagus nerve that goes from, it's your 10th cranial nerve and it connects all your, it's, you get so many sensations in your guts. You have a lot of nerves and you got a lot of nerve. You've got a lot of nerves in your digestive tract. That's called your enteric nervous system. The vagus nerve goes through like your organs, your heart, you know, so it's, it's the largest nerve in your body. And it has a lot to do with your response to stress, your ability right. to calm down and relax. If you have poor vagal tone, it's hard to relax. So this is a way that, that those nerves go through your intestines. Like you feel them in your intestines. And so like, so there's nerve, con- so there's a communication directly, like a nerve superhighway between your brain and your, your gut, your guts. Wow. And so at the same time, okay. So that's just the beginning. Like, that's just like the crude superhighway. Then there's like, like the internet, <laughs> which is like, it's the chemical signaling that's happening between not only these things called neuroendocrine cells, they're like hormones. It's like if you, you merged a hormone and a neuron, they're really fascinating. They've only been discovered for you know a few decades. Wow. And um, so those communicate, they use chemical signals to communicate, kind of like we send text messages, right? But they're chemical, right? And, um, and then also the microbe cells. Now here's the fun part. We are more microbial than human. We have more microbe cells than human cells in and on our body. So we're wow. no, something known as a symbiont. You are a symbiont. We're all symbionts. It's not gross. It's magic. So people could stop thinking microbes is gross. Yes, there are some microbes that make us sick, but there are so many more that if they're not happy and well and balanced and diverse and abundant, then we are sick and unhappy. And that really does feel gross. So, so and then these, these microbes, for example, Did you guys know that about like, this is a fact that a lot of people may have heard by now that about 90% of your serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that affects your concentration, your focus, your memory, but also your mood. Um, and also like peristalsis, like how things move through your intestines, kind of like a worm. And so that's made in your gut and in your microbes communicate through chemical signaling with your brain. So at the speed of life, it's so fast. So there's this direct, so if you have inflammation in your gut, if you have inflammation in your gut and your, um, or your microbes are out of balance and they usually go together because usually if your microbes, you protect your gut. And if your microbes aren't there to protect your gut, it can get inflamed. Or if you do things that cause inflammation in your gut, it can kill off the good helper microbes. So that usually goes together. So anyway, so as I was saying, if you're, gut is inflamed and doesn't have the right balance of microbes and the right abundance of microbes, then, um, what can end up happening is that you get inflammation in your brain. Also, what happens is you don't make the right chemicals in your gut. You don't make the right neurotransmitters. And so now you start having the wrong signals. It's like miscommunication starts happening. Kind of like how you get in a fight with someone, (laughs) Like, like your body starts like just, you know, starts dropping the ball. Your body's trying to always be in balance. Your body's so brilliant. Your body's genius. I call my website inner genius health because our, we're nature is genius. Nature is amazing. The more yeah. you learn about nature, you realize nature is genius and we're and nature. Isn't something outside of us. Like I go on a hike or go camping. We are nature. We're extensions of nature. Right. Mm. And so that means we're genius too. It means our bodies are genius. Our human cells and our microbe cells are genius. And when they have what they need to thrive, 
but we have this culture where we have, we've invented all these wonderful, amazing things like, you know, the internet, like, this is wonderful. I'm talking to someone in Peru and someone in New Zealand and I'm in Hawaii. This is cool. It is cool. Also, yeah. It's super cool. But we've also started inventing like a lot of weird chemicals that we thought, Hey, this will solve this problem. But what we didn't realize it's going to create like 20 more problems. We started mm. processing our food. We started, you know, contaminating agriculture. You know, we're what we're the only species I, I think on this planet anyway, that we actually poison our own food supply. And we have medications that are life-saving that are wonderful, but we have a lot of medications that cause some pretty serious side effects. And like a lot of people or even all people. And so sometimes even our medicine is poison. So it, it starts to get complicated, but I hope that starts to paint a picture of how there's this direct connection between your brain and your gut, which could affect your mood, like how you it does. Yeah. Well, you said something before that um, was really interesting and I'd like to explore is I'm, I'm on antidepressants. Um, and, you know, it's definitely been a mood stabilizer, but you said serotonin, it's kind of made or formed from in your gut. Yeah. 90% is made in your gut. So for example, there are things you could do to like, there's a test you could get called a GI map. Mm -hmm. And, um, I order these for my clients. Um, you, you know, it usually mainstream doctors don't order them unless they have some training in integrative or functional medicine or right. maybe naturopaths work with them a lot. But there's this, there's this lab called a GI map. There are other ones too. This just happens to be my favorite. Um, right. And it basically tells you who's in there and what they're doing and what's in balance, what's out of balance. It tells you if you have infections, if it tells you if certain bacteria that are normal, if they're too high or too low. And just look, look based on that bacteria, you can actually almost predict if someone has, say, low stomach acid or poor digestive right. function, you can tell if maybe they're, they're heading in the direction of autoimmune disease just based oh, on wow. the bacteria. Gut. Like there's, you can look at inflammatory markers in the gut. You can see if you have high zonulin, which would tell you if the lining of your small intestine has something called leaky gut or intestinal permeability, where the, the tight junctions, the cellular, the cellular glue basically is coming apart, coming unglued. And so that can cause allergies and all kinds of things, but it can also cause autoimmunity, but it can also cause anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And also like, like just not absorbing enough nutrients. You don't have enough of the building blocks you need to function normally, right? So to me, depression and anxiety are just symptoms. They're, they're not, we call them disorders because we need for our medical system to put a code with it so we can bill insurance, right? right. Well, that's yep. what we have. So, so there's a reason for that. But if you look at the reality of our biology, depression and anxiety, I, I overuse and abuse this, this metaphor, but it's my favorite. <laughs> it, they're like a smoke alarm. They're like a smoke alarm. And if your house is on fire and the smoke alarm goes off, now there are false alarms sometimes, but if this, yeah. if your house is on fire and your smoke alarm goes off and you just take the battery out of the smoke detector, what's going to happen? So you, you didn't put out the fire, you took out the battery. So maybe it's right. less annoying to watch your house burn down, but your body's trying to tell you if you have depression or anxiety, your, your sweet, precious, loyal body is trying to ask for help. It's trying to tell you, Liv, I need help. <laughs> Gabby or Tracy, I need help. And we, we don't have a culture. We have all this amazing science, but there's this, this kind of like, we need to build the bridge between this cutting edge science that has all this data about the microbiome, all these like discoveries in integrative and functional medicine that are so effective in getting people amazing outcomes. And I would love to see that bridge to our, our healthcare system. There's all, I don't, it's a big topic. All the politics are in the way of that. It's purely mm -hmm. politics that's blocking that. And, right. but, but the thing is, I don't want people to wait around for medical politics to sort themselves out the science already is here. Like we have tools. There are things we can do in our everyday lives and they're so simple and they're so pleasurable and they feel like home. When we start living in alignment with our evolutionary biology, meaning we start living the way we evolved to live, the way more like our ancestors, we don't have to go live in a forest or a cave or whatever. But mm -hmm. if we start just kind of moving the needle on that, the feeling inside is like you came home to yourself. It's beautiful. Yeah. And people think I have to give up pleasure to be healthy. There's nothing more pleasurable than nurturing and loving yourself and bringing your body back into balance. Totally. There's nothing that wow. better than that. Plus all the things you do to get healthy, like 
they're fun. Like they feel good. Like the food I eat is the best food ever. I eat the most delicious food ever. I'm not deprived. That's ridiculous. And Fine. there's so many things that are good for us that are fun. Like you've been playing with that life with like sewing and yoga and yeah, yeah. You know, or biking or whatever. There's so many fun things like pleasure and play. We've made pleasure like a cuss word or a dirty word, you know, like in a lot of, um, kind of European derived, you know, culture, especially cultures that shame sex a lot. We just think all pleasure is bad and we're supposed to feel guilty. No, like we're wired for pleasure. We're supposed to feel good. We're wired to feel good. And when we feel bad, that's just how nature talks to us. That's how nature just says, Hey, you know, I need something, you know, that's all it is. Speaking of wiring, something that caught my attention was, uh, when you were explaining about the connection of the brain and your gut, Mm-hmm. And you you sort of mentioned like uh you know there's like a miscommunication in a, in, in other words right mm. um how do you start creating I guess or you know linking or using the right channels to like create that balance again that good communication between the brain and and your gut how do you start treating your patients or like where do you start that's a wonderful question. Okay. And it actually, it helps me pick up where I kind of meandered off before yeah. <laughs> Never mind. all these different connections. And I have a very nonlinear brain. So, um, which is helpful, <laughs> but sometimes can be challenging in a conversation. So that's a great yeah. question. So, so for example, that test I told you about can tell you what's out of balance. And so mm-hmm. usually you feel your gut from North to South. So you want to make sure you have the right um, balance of stomach acid. A lot of people who have low stomach acid actually get reflux and then they get more acid suppression. So you have to make sure right. your stomach is working mm-hmm. right. You have enough stomach acid and your enzymes are working your nervous system. I'm going to tell you, I have this another, I'm a metaphoraholic, just so you know, I'm addicted to metaphors, but, uh, <laughs> so another one, another one I like to use is top down, bottom up because our brains can be rewired there's this whole field of brain science called neuroplasticity. And it just means like these connections in our brains can be rewired, reconnected to function differently. And so our thoughts change our brain wiring. And then our brain wiring changes the chemistry of our cells, the proteins that get made and all the chemical reactions in our bodies, right? Our immune system, our hormones, our neurotransmitters, our, how well our cells take in nutrients or get rid of waste or, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's crazy. And so, yeah. so when just changing our thinking and our breathing and our nervous system, we can rewire our nervous system to create a chemical or biological reality that makes it easier for your body to heal itself. But sometimes you have things going on, like say you have some kind of parasites, which it's, it's not gross. It's like you're a human on a planet. It's part of nature. So let's Hmm. say you have some kind of parasites or in my personal experience, I lived in a house with peeling paint that was lead paint. And I didn't realize how dangerous it was. And Uh. it also had toxic mold and I got really sick. So I could, I meditated, I ate healthy. I did all, I took supplements. I did all the right things. And I was still very sick. Why? I was being poisoned by my environment. So that's the bottom up. So the top down is rewiring your brain and nervous system for more calm. But the bottom up is we got to get the stuff out of there. That's like the, all the big speed bumps that are keeping your body from healing. It helps to have labs to get data about what's happening in your body. So you can heal yourself. Um, but there's also so many things you can do with lifestyle. So I have, I have like a three legged table. I have three pillars to what I do with people. So I think this might answer your question, Gabby. Um, Mm -hmm. So the, the first pillar is, I call it a lifestyle makeover because makeovers are fun. <laughs> I, want people to I love them. <laughs> Upgrade your lifestyle. So we do lifestyle yeah. work. So it's food, it's sleep, it's thoughts, emotions, relationships. I mean, movement, biomechanics, mm-hmm. like how, you know, do you have back pain because you sit in an office chair and with bad, you know, ergonomics all the time. I mean, it's just kind of like, like go through, do a 360 degree review of your life and see what's working really well and what's not working so well. And we just make things better and it's fun and it feels good. And then we have the, the pillar of, um, your functional medicine or integrative medicine, your healthcare strategy. So basically we figure out what labs are testing or resources or diagnostics. Can we get from your regular doctor that, you know, if you're in a place with insurance, the insurance will cover, or if you have, um, you know, um, government healthcare that the government will pay for, but what can you get taken care of for free? So we make the best use of that first. And then whatever else is left, then find, you know, what labs 
you know, do you need to get them more information to get your solutions? Right. So we know what strategy mm. to use. So that's kind of like mm. being, that's like project management. So that's like, I'm kind of like a project manager for people's health issues. And then the third pillar, and this one is so important. Whenever I do like a Venn diagram of my three pillars, I put this one at the bottom because it's the base. This is the emotional support, the compassionate com accountability, the brain, the mind. it's the consciousness part. It's like how your mind thinks about what you're capable of. Cause so many people not only are looking for solutions, a lot of people doubt what they're capable of. They don't think they're capable. Mm -hmm. They think they, Oh, I don't have good um, willpower or I'm a hedonist. I just want to feel good. So I'm never going to give up whatever the thing is. But the thing is wow. I'm a bigger hedonist because a hedonist, like you pursue pleasure. Well, there's nothing that's more pleasurable than taking care of yourself, loving yourself, nurturing yourself. There's so many mm. things you can do that are pleasurable that actually heal you instead of tearing you down. We just happen to have like, like a lot of modern industrialized culture has, we fetishized pleasures that are destructive and we overlook pleasures that are healing. And so it's just shifting the balance on that. And it's having accountability. It's having support. It's having um, changing your stinking thinking, like having the right mindset and to know you're capable. Like I've never seen someone who couldn't heal because they were somehow inherently flawed and they just got the bad pick of the human lottery. I've seen people who couldn't heal because they were not open to changing their way of thinking. So that's really, if I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say to me, one of the root causes of illness is stubbornness. I, <laughs> I love, I love that. that. Yeah. That basically calls us all, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, all of us. Because I'm very this stubborn. <laughs> yes, yeah, I can be. But do you know why we're stubborn? We're stubborn because we have a survival brain that's mm -hmm. like, you know what? I've been doing this my whole life. It's familiar. I'm not dead yet. It must be working. Leave me alone. <laughs> I don't want to make neural pathways to figure out new ways to do things when I already have this stuff figured out. And because I'm anxious or stressed or depressed, I don't have the extra energy for it. Mm, um, yeah. So that's like a belief, right? So that's the primal survival brain. But then we have the neocortex. We have our higher brain and that part of our brain loves learning and it loves novelty and it loves surprise and it loves adventure and it loves exploration. And it loves, you know, this is the part of our brain that can really get us out of the hole and heal us. So a lot of the work I do with people is to go in and work with the primal brain and really not make it bad or wrong, but love it integrate it, give it new jobs, make it part of the process, bring it in as a loving, beloved part of the process and understand it. So it's not like being pushed to the side or exiled mm. and make it part of the formula and, but let their higher self, your wisdom brain have more control over your decision-making because that primal brain, mm. it's like a two-year-old. It's not that it's not a grown up. It, it shouldn't be making our decisions. Yeah, because I was going to say before on that front with when it comes to diet and things. Oh, you said your three pillars, right? Right. So for the average person, I know that obviously this changes by person to person's lifestyle. But say you're dealing or you're talking to anxious and, and depressed people uh, potentially right now, like what are things what are things that we should be eating? What are things that we should be doing and emotionally making sure that we have enough of to to balance those pillars right good questions number one is i'm going to tell you what to eat first because i don't like doing the don't eat this without the eat this first because people gotcha. start thinking you're taking everything away from me but no 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 no. there's <laughs> things like don't worry about it you're not yeah. going to give up anything that actually serves you and there's always something that's just as pleasurable that's better for you so gotcha. the things you want to focus on eating is you, your brain needs, your brain is made up of so much fat, like lipids and cholesterol. You need good fat. So that whole low fat movement caused so much damage to people's brains and nervous systems. Wow. So um, I lived through that. Like I was the most obese. I used to be 50 pounds overweight and I was the biggest I ever was on a low fat diet. So you need wow. to make sure when you cook with oils, you get like either extra virgin or unrefined oils, like olive oil, um, virgin coconut oil or unrefined sesame oil. And, um, I love ghee because ghee has the lactose and the dairy proteins like casein and albumin that can cause inflammation in the brain and gut taken out. So mm. ghee is a clarified mm. butter. So if you get that from grass fed cows, if you're not vegan, um, and you get that from, I'm not vegan, but I like to, you know, accommodate, you know, whatever right. people want. So grass fed ghee is really important when you eat animal products. If you do, 
Um, you want pat, you want animals that lived outside. So going back to, so go back to thinking ancestral diets. So, um, you know, wild game like venison or, you know, animals that got to live outside and be in sunshine and eat mm. grass. And you know what I'm saying? And chickens should live outside and they're not vegetarians. They eat bugs. You know, they shouldn't mm. be vegetarian. They should live outside and they should peck the ground and they should get bugs. Right. Mm. And so you want those animals to eat a healthy diet, you know, and be, unstressed because when you eat the meat of a stressed out animal, like that adrenaline, those chemicals, you eat them and you feel them. Oh my God. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, either it's the first time I'm thinking about it like that. (laughs) Yeah. Cause like when you, when you eat chicken, for instance, well, for me, I've got like a, a quite sensitive stomach and I find that out of all the meat that I eat, chicken is the worst in the sense of I feel like crap the next day I feel horrible like yeah yeah. what about you Gabby what kind of what kind of food do you tend to steer clear of and things I was just uh hearing you say that I was just thinking about how like so for example right now I'm in Peru and I don't know I just in general the food I eat here seems to be more natural Mm. for some reason and I say this because when I, every time I go back to the States and I was just talking about that with my sister, because we were talking about how we were like uh, breaking out, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, did you notice that when we are in the US, the chicken, we're not vegan either, but um, we tried sometimes to minimize our, our dairy consumption just because yeah. I had like during my teens, I had like terrible, terrible acne. So when we go back to the States, the first thing we notice is that when we eat chicken or milk, for example, or the cheese, we like immediately break out. And Amazing, it, we yeah. had this theory for a long time, but we actually, last time we were there, we sort of confirmed it. We already expected it to happen and it did, you know, and it's like, we have to start either eating like super organic or like making sure that, you know, tracing our chicken or our meat or where it's coming from or like buying the super expensive ones because it really happens to us. And I don't, I don't even know. I, I, I didn't think about it like that much until I heard mm. you say that. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm glad you said the O word organic, because that gets rid of so many neurotoxins. So there's so many chemicals that are added to our food that are literally neurotoxins. That means it's a poison to your nervous system. If you have anxiety oh. and depression, mm. it means your nervous system is not regulating properly. It means there's two, there's a mess going on in there and you can have genetic predispositions, which are often like in my genetics, I have some genes that make me very sensitive to mold. I have some genes that make it a little harder for me to synthesize vitamin D from the sun. And then I have some genes that make it a little harder for me to detoxify, which makes me more sensitive. And all that means is that my body really needs me to not be mean to it. Like it really, (laughs) it's like, Hey, I'm not wired to be poisoned. So could you knock it off? Right. So does that make me weak? No, it just means my body is like, Hey, that's not cool. You know, and I'm honoring that. Yeah. I choose to honor that not to be a snob, not, you know, not for any other reason than self-love and self-respect. And because it feels good to feel good. That's it. So mm-hmm. organics, if you shop organic, you get rid of so many chemicals that can cause cancer and that are something called endocrine disruptors or they disrupt hormones wow. and that are neurotoxins that poison your nervous system. Wow. So that alone is a huge improvement. So you want to do two things. You want to improve the quality. So for shorthand, I teach my people, I'm like, you want to eat high vibe versus low vibe. Cause that's kind of intuitive. Right. right. Um, and so, and you want to eat a lot of vegetables and lots of colors, lots of colors of lots of vegetables. And it's good to know the difference between non-starchy vegetables, which is something, if you're not familiar with, I suggest you look it up on the interweb. Um, what, what are non-starchy vegetables? They're like the waxy rubbery ones, like broccoli and cauliflower and green beans and leafy greens and you know, all those, especially cruciferous vegetables. That's another thing you want to look up cruciferous. And these are vegetables that have are high in these sulfur compounds like sulforaphane that actually help you detoxify. They help protect you from estrogenic cancers. They help you have the healthy kind of estrogen and not the kind of estrogen that causes cancer. They can also, it's a compound that also helps prevent you from getting cancer and helps your immune system kill existing cancer cells. So they're amazing. So you want to eat lots of variety of vegetables and you want to eat like the really good unprocessed fats or fats from healthy animals. You want to eat protein from healthy, um, organic animal and plant sources. You want to use lots of herbs and spices, be a spice girl or a spice guy. You want to 
like use herbs and spices, play with your food because there are so many compounds, so many chemicals and that are like medicine that give our cells a leg up. So the, mm-hmm. it's like the, the vegetables and the plant matter and the, the herbs and spices, they have all these chemicals that our bodies are like, I'll use some of that. I'll use some of that. Ooh, some of that. Ooh, I can use this. And your body can use these things to get rid of bad chemicals that make us sick. They can use those things to take down inflammation, to feed your microbes that are your allies and you need them. You need them. If our microbes died, we would die. We need them. It's a functional organ. It's like your liver, your kidney. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of our hormones and are regulated by not only the glands that make the hormones, but our liver and our microbes. Amazing. So it's hard to have balanced hormones and imbalanced hormones can cause anxiety and depression, like nobody's business. So you're basically think of your body as a symphony of cells and you're trying to harmonize the symphony. You're like the conductor of this symphony and you're trying to bring in harmony. And the thing is the symphony, you don't have to micromanage it. It's really smart. Just stop doing mean things to it and give it lots of good things and it will sort it out. Now there are things you can do that are more strategic, right? With supplements and herbs and things like that. But in terms of the life, in terms of just food, another thing to be aware of, depending on your genetics and your gut health, you could become for a while sensitive to foods that are high in something called histamines and Mm. high histamine Mm. foods can trigger anxiety. Um, there's, um, glutamine is, um, it's an amino acid that can actually help with sugar cravings and help heal your gut lining. But in certain people, not everybody glutamine, I'm not saying glutamine is bad. It's good for so many people, but L-glutamine for some people who are anxiety prone, not everybody can actually make your anxiety worse. And foods that are higher in glutamine are bone broth, um, collagen, protein, gelatins, things like that. Are these bad foods? No, these are great foods. If you can tolerate them, eat them. But if you notice if something's triggering you, like the chicken, notice if the chicken, does it bother you like the day you eat it? Or if you eat leftover chicken, does it bother you more? Because it might be higher in histamines Mm. or maybe the broth or the sauce with it. So there's nothing wrong with chicken if it's good quality, but, um, you know, and, and, there's so many different reasons chicken could trigger you live. Like, I mean, yeah. it could be something about the protein, something going on in your gut. It could right. be something to do with the quality of the chicken and the chemicals that were in the chicken's muscle tissue. It could have something to do with how old it is. If it's high in mm. histamines, and it could be something to do with the broth or sauce if you're sensitive to glutamine. So, but these are things that wow. can be corrected over time. You don't have to avoid them forever. You want to yeah. repair, plug the leak not just keep, you know, like, you know, keep taking the bucket and see, say you're, you're in a boat that's it's, it has leaks and it's drowning and you just keep taking buckets and scooping the water overboard. It's exhausting. If you plug the leaks and then get the water overboard, then it's much easier. Right. So I was reading this article about how obviously refined sugar is probably your, your worst enemy, but how about like natural sources of sugar, for example, fruit, like one time I was told that, for example, bananas can be bad when you eat them too, when they're too ripe, you know, when they're already dark, oh. um, people use them, for example, for like smoothies and, or cakes. But uh, one time I was told that, oh, no, that's too sweet. You shouldn't eat that. Or like, what was the other one? Mangoes, I think, that are too <gasps> sweet. Okay, let's back up that. Yeah, so- <laughs> you guys ask such good questions. Okay, <laughs> you. my opinion. Anyway, okay, so I want to get to things that cause inflammation because remember Mm. I talked about how if you have inflammation in your gut or in your cells, you have inflammation in your brain. Like, so inflammation is the enemy of mental health. Some of the most toxic and inflammatory foods, we have all the processed chemicals. So organic gets rid of that for the most part, but then we have sugar causes inflammation, but when it's pharmaceuticalized, when it has been chemically processed to the point of being like a white crystalline powder, right? Mm -hmm. That is not the same as sugar in a sweet potato because a sweet potato has fiber and it has all these other phytonutrients or plant nutrients that slow down blood sugar. Also, when you eat something sweet with protein and fat, that also slows the spike of blood sugar right? Mm. So it's like how you combine your food, but also the quality of it. So when people talk about carbs or sugar, like it's all the same, are you talking about like white table sugar or Haagen-Dazs ice cream? Are you talking about a sweet potato or a mango? Yes. Mangoes are higher glycemic and ripe bananas are higher glycemic. If you're severely diabetic, you probably need to pay attention to that. If you're not diabetic Mm -hmm. or morbidly obese or whatever, eat a mango. Don't stress about it, but don't eat 12 mangoes in one day. You know what I mean? And don't <laughs> yeah. want to use ripe bananas to make banana bread. It's fine. We have to put things in context, right? So okay. is sugar 
in a whole like food, whole plant context? Like, is it a fruit? Is it a root vegetable or is the sugar something we've extracted to make a crystalline powder or a syrup? Mm. Now, even in the, these concentrated sweeteners, like for example, a raw local honey bees have magic. They have microbes in their gut that we used to have before we sterilized ourselves and kind of messed ourselves up. So they have like these ancient microbes and they have enzymes. Like honey has magic. Honey's magical. Mm -hmm. Now, if you eat a pound of honey a week, you're going to gain weight and have blood sugar issues. Right. So it's like, if you eat a little bit of honey, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's fine. If you're like addicted and you're just like eating it out of the jar, like every day, then it's going to become an imbalance, right? It's about balance. Now, coconut sugar, it's a little more processed than honey, but it's, um, it's easier on the immune system. It's less inflammatory. But again, if you eat tons and tons of it every day, well, it's coconut sugar, it's paleo. It's great. You know, then you can <laughs> cause an imbalance, but if you eat a little bit, sometimes yeah. that's fine. like when I have a birthday, right. like I have someone make me a gluten-free cake. Um, we'll have to get to gluten there in a minute. It has no gluten, has no dairy, it does have ghee. Um, and then, yeah. And they make it with all really delicious, you know, and they use coconut sugar, or honey or dates or whatever to make it. And like, no one's like eating yeah. that cake. Like, um, this is like healthy cake. Ugh. Everyone's like, Oh my God, this is delicious. Like, they don't- <laughs> so yeah. So that's a really good question. I dates and raw local honey are my favorite sweeteners of the sweeteners that actually have a blood sugar impact of the kind of zero calorie ones. I like pure monk fruit, but no urethritol in it. I don't like the sugar alcohols. Now, if you're completely addicted to sugar or diabetic, and maybe you're going to, you're risky, you have diabetic wounds and you know, okay, maybe mm. use erythritol as a bridge. Right. Um, but for an optimal diet, I would really prefer that you use, um, you know, raw local honey or dates or something like that. Maybe maple syrup, a little bit of coconut sugar, but then, you know, use maybe like monk fruit extract. That's just the monk fruit and no added anything. Read the labels, read your, Mm. read labels. Don't read the marketing on the front of the package, read the ingredients. I will not put something in my mouth till I read the ingredients because you Mm. would be shocked what's in stuff and what they don't, even in health foods to preview what they'll put on the front and you read the label. You're like, what is this doing in here? Why does my sunflower butter need a bunch of white sugar and palm oil in it? That's ridiculous. Mm. It says Mm -hmm. no stir on front. It's not no stir always means they added cheap inflammatory oil and white sugar to your nut butter. Like nice. So, Love that. so anyway, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news on this one. Like, I feel like everyone's going to hate me when I say this one, well, sugar can already make people mad, but, but yeah. gluten causes damage to the intestinal lining of every human. There's this scientist, Alessio Faisano. He's this Italian researcher. I think it's really appropriate that an Italian researcher from the <laughs> country of pasta and bread, um, he was researching celiac disease and found out right. there's this protein called zonulin that every time any human eats gluten, Um, This can also happen if you have some kind of gut infection. It can also happen if you're exposed to glyphosate or Roundup. This can cause the production of a a protein called zonulin. And tiny amounts of zonulin is fine. It has has an evolutionary reason it exists. It's a way to prime your immune system. But when we make too much of it, it actually starts breaking down that that glue, like the mortar between bricks in our intestinal lining. And then proteins get out into and then that your brain remembers those proteins. And then that can trigger, um, you know, mental health symptoms, aches and pains, um, allergies, um, rashes, skin things. I mean, it just goes on and on and on basically systemic inflammation. So if you struggle with mental health or chronic illness or chronic pain, you might really want to give it a go. Just letting go of gluten. It's never been easier to be gluten-free. There's so many alternatives. Just think of like, we the gluten grains, it's like, what it's like five or six grains. I don't know exactly how many, but it's like how many plants on the whole planet. Like look at the Amazon jungle, look at how many plants are on this planet that we can eat. Yeah. And we're obsessed with the ones that have this molecule in it. Like who cares? There's so many like rice is gluten-free. It's delicious. The gluten-free oats, oats don't have gluten. They just, they have to be labeled gluten-free because they get processed with wheat in factories and they get wheat flour mixed in with the oats. And some people get sick from that. So, but, right. but oats don't have gluten. Um, Teff doesn't have gluten. Um, cassava doesn't have gluten. Um, corn doesn't have gluten. Um, rice doesn't have gluten. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. There's so many things that don't have gluten. Like why be obsessed with wheat? It's just like one plant. Like who cares, mm. you know? Like, yeah. There's wheat, there's barley. Yeah. It can be a little socially, but it's, it's getting easier and easier. And there are just so many, there are more and more good 
bread recipes, cakes, pies, blah, 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 you can eat. And the difference between eating a pie made with like organic fresh fruit and a gluten-free crust with like hardly any, you know, like really high quality, low glycemic sweeteners and good fats because fat is delicious. Like put ghee and coconut oil in your desserts. And it's just like, oh my God, you know, cinnamon and and whatever, ginger, like it's amazing. Like it's so, it's like a party in your mouth. So, yeah, you know, (laughs) I love not that big of a deal. So being healthy is pleasurable. It's not that hard. It's just like getting our head to our mindset to change to like, really think, wow, I'm not on a restricted diet. I'm on an, like a, a loving, nurturing, intelligent, discerning, biologically intelligent diet. I don't even like the word diet. Diet, but anyway, yeah, it's not not the not the word to use anymore, is it? Diet. Um, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) gluten, gluten, processed sugars, a lot of sugars. So gluten, junk. I just call it junk sugars for short. So gluten, junk sugars, and then cow dairy has these proteins called A1 proteins that Mm -hmm. are um, more they're more inflammatory. They trigger more of an immune response than the proteins from things like goat and sheep. So some people can't have any dairy. Period. Most people can still have ghee though. But some people can actually tolerate goat cheese and sheep cheese, but just not the cow cheese. And right. there's also sheep like yogurt and whatever and cheese. So you can kind of play with that and see how you feel, you know, maybe get off all of it, clear your acne or whatever, see how you feel. And then maybe just add a little goat chev or add a little manchego cheese from Spain or just, you know, like just play with it and see Very how you're high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that gluten calorie sugar and then eating organic and eating lots of vegetables and eating better fats, just the herbs and spices, just those changes alone will make a huge difference and mm-hmm. your physical and mental health. Um, something I just wanted to ask on that front of sugar, because like you say, the gluten is so it's in this day and age, it's pretty easy to cut out given the alternatives that are available to us now, or especially where I am anyway. Um, but one thing that I struggle with, and I know a lot of other young people struggle with is sugar and sugar cravings, because for me, right. if I, if I'm craving a a block of chocolate or half a block of chocolate one night there's nothing that's getting in the way between me and that chocolate and I really I really wish there was I wish there was a chocolate police person that could just be like stop Uh, (laughs) think (laughs) but yeah yeah so okay so craving so Mm. number one I like to use metaphors of like you're in a toxic relationship and I'm not saying actually your chocolate's bad by the way so let's just put a pen in that okay let's say sugar anyway you're in a relationship that's really unhealthy and mm. it's terrible and you're miserable, but you, you're kind of addicted to each other and you do love each other, but it's just not good. You know, you should get out and then you eventually yeah. get out and then years go by and you look back at that relationship and you're like, wow, I would never do that again. And you know, you no. don't care, respect the person, but you don't want to go back. Like once mm. you get off these processed foods, then you don't miss them anymore and you don't crave them anymore. Um, like I just got a text from a client the other day who was saying, you know, he's like all my cravings for like McDonald's and pizza. I'm not saying you can eat healthy pizza and healthy hamburgers, but Mm. he was just saying all my, my cravings for this fast food processed food are gone. And I feel like I'm controlling my food instead of my food controlling me and Mm, all change the quality and balance of his nutrients. He was on a low fat, low protein diet where he was eating hardly any protein because he followed this doctor who I'm not going to name because I don't like to talk about people that way, but I just feel like his data, like, I mean, he's following something that he came up with in the sixties and hasn't really updated. So he was, he was starving his body of fat. He was starving his body of protein. And then he was just hungry all the time. Usually when you get enough fat and enough protein, you don't crave a bunch of sugar and carbohydrates. Also, when you don't overeat carbs are good for you. You need them just the good kind, not the crappy Mm. kind and in balance, not eating a bowl of rice, the size of your head and eating like a handful of rice, not like a face full of rice. Right. And so, um, So a lot of it will, the cravings tend to go away when you get your nutritional needs met, because you're usually hungry because you're missing nutrients or sometimes you're hungry because you ate something that triggered. So there's a hormone called leptin that tells you you're full. And so things like artificial sweeteners, um, MSG and its relatives, um, like free glutamates. And I know I'm missing something and just like processed sugars and refined flours and all this stuff for different reasons can interfere with that hormone that tells you you're full. There's some right. people speaking of mm. glutamine. There's some people who do take L glutamine to curb sugar cravings and that kind of thing. Um, 
So you just want to make sure, like if you try it and you start getting more anxious or shaking or feeling like you just ate a bunch of MSG or caffeine, then you want to like, maybe not take that. That's really not your solution. But what I find is when you kind of do a, a dovetail effect where you start reducing your super processed foods and upgrading. So your snacks are now organic chips and your desserts. Like here, we have this here in the United States, there's this paleo ice cream sandwich called coconut girl. And it's like really good quality ingredients. So you like Mm. eat those ice cream sandwiches or those frozen desserts instead of the crappy ones. And you start, you start upgrading your junk food. And, but then you start really bring cooking more and bringing in more real food and you eat more balanced meals. You eat a lot of good fats and you eat enough protein for your body's cravings and you eat enough, um, you know, vegetables and use herbs and spices and you make your food pleasurable and you sit and you be present with your food and you enjoy eating it. You don't inhale it while you're emailing people. Like you Mm -hmm. really sit and breathe while you eat and taste your food and like, just mm, like make love to your food, you know, just really, (laughs) you know, like make it sexy and sensual, you know, like when you really do that, then that whole need to like, oh my God, I need to go do this. I need to go do that. Like it, it, it starts to evaporate. Now there Mm -hmm. are other reasons we can have cravings. Um, and, and if you are going to eat chocolate, just get one that's sweetened with coconut sugar or honey or maple syrup and not like this white sugar and, you know, mm. have it be, you know, kind of the more the dark chocolate and that kind of thing. So just get better quality chocolate, get organic, fair trade, whatever chocolate with a, with a pretty conscious sweetener, like the paleo movement's done a lot for improving a lot of things. Now, sometimes that I'm not against gluten-free grains, which paleo, they don't do grains and paleo often overdoes the nuts and nut flowers, which can be really hard on your gut. So mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. caution people with all these nut flowers. Cause that can be, give you something I call nut gut. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, it goes on and on. There's so many layers to it, but, um, but yeah, and just oh. be aware of it. <laughs> chocolate at night. Cause it's a stimulant. So there's something uh-huh. very much like caffeine and chocolate. So eating chocolate at night can like, you know, make you anxious the next day, um, mm. or make it hard to sleep. And then also mm. stimulants like caffeine. I never have anyone just get off caffeine cold Turkey. Cause your brain will freak out, but like weaning off caffeinated coffee and going more to a naturally decaffeinated, a water decaffeinated, um, coffee, the chemically decaffeinated coffee, the, the coffee that's been chemically decaffeinated is actually worse for you than the caffeine. So wow. anyway, but, but if you have anxiety, um, here's the deal. Anxiety can be exhausting. So then people want more energy. So they eat more sugar and drink more caffeine, but using caffeine and sugar for energy is like using a credit card to buy everything and not having money in your bank account. Right. So yeah. you're, you're robbing energy from your future self. So if you don't have enough in your energy bank account, like, and you start making withdrawals, like you're just going to run yourself into the ground. So it's better to get energy from hugs. It's better to get energy from like really nutritious foods. It's better to get energy from movement or from looking at a sunset or going for a walk in a forest. Like these are better ways to get energy. That's how you get true energy. There are even some wonderful supplements, like in all kinds of weird, funky things like chlorella and shilajit. Like they're all weird things that like give yourselves energy. I mean, red light gives yourselves energy doing Mm -hmm. things like contrast hydrotherapy, where you get in hot water and then cold water and then hot water and cold water. That's very invigorating to the mitochondria or the energy centers of your cells. So there's so many cool ways you can get your cells to heal and produce more energy instead of just trying to like force it out of them. Like you will give me energy. Here's some caffeine, you know, here's some sugar. Oh, go, (laughs) you know. But if you notice with sugar, it's like, you're like, I have energy. And then you're like, oh God, I need a nap or more sugar yeah. or both. So much to learn. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I like know. shook of all the things that you have to keep <laughs> in mind. But, you know, like you said, it, it's your body. You have to put in the effort. One thing I wanted to ask you, something that I read, like the relationship that you have, but you, you eat it like angry or like, like something's going on that is making you very emotional and, and like you're angry, you know, and you're eating it because you need to, you need to eat to gain energy or because you're hungry. Right. Is it true that you can like observe it differently? So basically what I hear you asking Gabby is like yeah. your state of consciousness when you're eating and how it affects, well, two, there are two points here that I think you brought to light one. Why are you eating? Are you eating because you're hungry? Or are you eating mm. because you're trying to not feel something? So when, when I do the top down work, so the bottom up would be like all the, the gut healing and the supplements and the, you know, changing your, your lifestyle, but the top down 
is re being really, one of the things I notice is we have a culture that teaches us not to feel our bodies and emotions. And so mm -hmm. we don't want to feel anything that's uncomfortable. So we'll go stuff our emotions with food. We'll also try to eat foods that give us, um, we're trying to boost our serotonin or we're trying to make happy chemicals by eating things that'll give us a quick kind of fix. Um, you know, eating your emotions, stuffing your emotions. So like just being aware, not shaming it though. Like sometimes we're gonna binge eat. So I'd rather you make sure whatever you have in your kitchen is like not going to hurt you. So at least yeah. upgrade your junk or have pre-made food. That's really healthy. So at least if you're going to stress eat, you're stress eating healthy food instead of destructive food, right? Um, stay mm -hmm. away from drive throughs you know, that kind of thing. Just have yourself stocked in case that does happen. And you do engage in that behavior. You're, you're protecting yourself. You have a safety net or it's not going to be that bad, but then also and not judge it because it's such a, a primal survival thing. You're not defective or weak or wrong when you want to do that. It's so primal. It's so human to want to do that, but we can learn to catch it. We can rebalance our brain. We can feel our emotions more. We can have other tools for processing our emotions that I call it emotional hygiene, just like we, you know, we floss and brush our teeth and wash our hands. And we do all these mm -hmm. things for physical hygiene, but we don't, we're not really taught in our culture, really good emotional hygiene. So yeah. then we mm -hmm. have all emotions and we don't know what to do with them. And so then we just do these things that don't serve us just because our toolbox needs to be updated. That's all. And so, mm -hmm. and I think the second point, Gabriela, to your question is, um, when you eat in a distressed state, like you're angry or upset or fearful or anxious, mm. when we're in a fight or flight or a stress brain state, we mm -hmm. actually don't make as much stomach acid. And so if you don't have enough stomach acid, then that valve between your stomach and your esophagus doesn't close properly. And you can actually have reflux and it feels like heartburn mm. or like you're having a heart attack. But what can also happen, even if that doesn't happen is if you have low stomach acid, when the, the food in your stomach passes to your small intestine, the pH of your stomach actually triggers your pancreas to make, to release enzymes and your gallbladder to release bile. What that means, these are your gastric juices. This is your digestive fire. This is the chemicals that break down the food into nutrients that we can absorb and transport to our cells to have a healthy, happy body. So if we're eating, when we're agitated, then we can absorb our nutrients as well. We, yeah. we, and, and it can create inflammation and it can create gut problems that can actually cause eventually an inflammation pattern that can actually lead to anxiety and depression. Do you see mm. how it's like all loops in on itself? Like it's all so intricately connected. Everything is, Everything connected. is connected. Yeah. Like yeah. you say, like, it's just about working and finding out what your body <laughs> needs in each of the spaces to balance out. Well, I'm not a doctor, obviously, yeah. but that's what I'm kind of learning yeah. to understand about myself now. And I think actually we've talked about this before, eh, Gabby, like just learning about yeah. ourselves, even like through going to counseling can sometimes help right. you pick up on things that your body yeah. does. Yeah. Right. Self-awareness, self-knowledge, like mm, we're, yeah. we're never, we're, we have to be our own best friends and we have to be so curious about ourselves and we, you know, it's, it never ends. There's always more layers and we wouldn't want totally. it to end because it's, it's, it's a journey and you don't want to yeah. run out of growth. You don't want to run out of things to learn and evolve. Mm. Like we don't ever want to no. stop. That's it's fun to learn and grow and evolve. And so yeah. I feel like, I really feel like when we have a physical illness, mental, emotional illness, to me, it's all the same. When we mm. have a health challenge or mental health challenge, that's an opportunity. That's a doorway to transformation. That's oh, a doorway. totally to making our lives better than we could have ever thought possible. So we, and we're told, oh, well, you just have a chemical imbalance. It's probably genetic here. Take this pill or these pills the rest of your life. And that's it. Bye-bye. You know, and you can go to therapy, which is great. There is supportive therapy and there are different kinds of therapy. Some are mm -hmm. more effective than others. And um, they're different kinds of therapy have different functions. Like some are like the cognitive where you can reframe the way you think, rewire your thinking, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy. Then there's um, somatic therapy, which is more work on trauma and how we store trauma in our body. So there are things mm -hmm. like EMDR and, you know, there are so many different um, somatic experiencing. So there's so many tools. The thing is, I want people to know there's so many tools. You've never tried everything. You may think I I've tried everything and it didn't work, but that's not true. You've never tried everything. I really believe that when we're willing to do what it takes to heal, we will find our way. 
I really I do. do. And, it, and yeah. it does take time. And we want, we have a culture. We want everything now. Like, you know, mm. here we have like amazon.com. I can, you know, mm. I have a friend who lives in Seattle. He get like, I'm in Hawaii. I'm excited when I get something in three days. I'm like, wow, that was fast. You know, he gets something in <laughs> yeah. two hours. He, he, yeah. he just orders it on Amazon and it shows up at his door in hours. And it's like, we're, we, we, we haven't learned. We need to learn to operate at the speed of life, at the speed yeah. of biology to be patient, to, to really put in a little bit every day and reap the benefits over time. And that's why I work with people in programs. Like I used to do kind of one-off consults. I don't like doing that. I want someone to be like, you're mine for 12 weeks. We're going to, we're going to like, I'm going to take you and we're going to like get through this together. Like I'm, I'm have your back, you know, I'm yeah, going to get down in the trenches <laughs> with you, take you through this process. And and so, because like, when you do that, then you can give them bite-sized pieces and you can say, okay, today we're just going to work on this thing. Yeah. And today we're just going to work on this thing. And like, probably this interview is like a fire hose of information. <laughs> oh, totally. You don't, it yeah, really is. You <laughs> the point isn't to remember all this and be like, now I have to go home and figure this all out. No, yeah, it's yeah. just a yeah. takeaway. What's your takeaway? I would hope I'm going to tell what I hope you can tell me what your takeaway is, but my hope is that, you know, everything's connected. And our daily thoughts and actions create our biology. And then our biology mm. influences our daily thoughts and actions. And this, our mental health and physical health derive from this. And we have more power over our mental and physical health than we're really ever taught we do. And there are so many pleasurable ways that work if we just have to change our mindset and it's doable because we have these neuroplastic mm -hmm. brains, right? And I want you to know that your genius, your body's genius, even if you have had chronic illness or chronic anxiety, hardly anyone with chronic anxiety doesn't have other things going on medically. It's almost never mm. the case. Like that you just yeah. have anxiety yeah. because there's a reason you have anxiety. Anxiety is a symptom. Depression is a symptom, right? Mm. So I want people to know there are ways to heal your gut, to get data about your gut. There are ways to heal your gut, to rebalance those microbes, to get your tummy working, your pancreas, get your organs happy, um, get your nervous system calmed down, get your cells chugging along. You know, like there's so many ways to just start harmonizing yourself and coming into balance. And so much of it, actually, it just feels good. It's a lovely journey. It's a beautiful thing. And you don't do it all at once. No one does anything all at once. You do it one no, step yeah. at a time, one breath at a time. And you don't have to remember all this. It's just no. the impression I want to give you is that there are solutions. Yeah, no. Well, thank you for, for sharing what you have today. I think there's a lot to take away from this. But like you say, if you- I feel like we need things, a part two. <laughs> we need, might need a part two. I'm happy, I'm happy to do a part two. So much. <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. Well, um, for those who want to find out a little bit more about you, Tracy, where and um, what, what should they do? Where do they go? Well, you can go to my website, innergeniushealth.com. So some people think I'm saying energy or something. It's inner genius, like the genius inside of you. So innergeniushealth.com. And my name is Dr. Tracy Potter. And because my name is spelled so strangely, if you Google me, you will find me. I'm so smart. <laughs> right. And then um, I also have, I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So cool. if you just right. Google my name, you'll, you'll find me. Yeah. I love yeah, your well, website, by the way. It's so clean. calming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. When I, I was, yeah, I was like doing a little bit of research. I was like, oh my God, I feel peace. Yeah. <laughs> that Aww. was like my, my, you know, the vibe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, very, um, energizing to look at but like in mm -hmm. a sense of it's really yeah. calm you know like when certain things like portfolios and things reflect someone yours does that perfectly <laughs> like, I was gonna say that yeah yeah oh, you right. guys are so fun you guys ask such such great questions like oh. I, I love having these conversations thank with you, you. So I'm gonna do a part two I'm totally down yeah cool we'll be in touch no, yeah all right well thank you so much for for joining us Tracy thanks for joining the show today and um yeah I really look forward to sharing this with the everyone when we we uploaded this week so <laughs> it's good